Hello, everyone. Warm welcome to this book talk with Anne Applebaum in GMF's Understanding America webinar series. Today, we would like to discuss Ms. Applebaum's recent powerful book, Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. My name is Daniel Hegedusch, and I serve as fellow for Central Europe at GMF. Through many personal stories, mostly of former friends and acquaintances of the author, the book tells us the history of the schism of the political right in the West and the treason of its intellectuals, the pundits who used to be part of the united former Cold Warrior center-right political family, but now serve the political project Applebaum calls new authoritarianism. In comparison with the rest of the literature published during the last couple of years, which mostly focused on the demon side of populism and autocratization, on the question why the electorate support the forces of new authoritarianism, Ms. Applebaum's book stands out by investigating the supply side, depicting new authoritarianism as a conscious elite-led project. Therefore, the question of individual responsibility for the twilight of democracy forms the essence of the book. May this responsibility be moral, political, or historical? At least for Central and Eastern Europeans like me, the author needs no introduction. Anne Applebaum is one of the best known Anglo-Saxon historians working on the region. Her former books, Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine, and Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, are standard works on the post-Second World War history of the region. Her other book, Gulag, A History, won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction in 2004. Anne Applebaum is currently staff writer at The Atlantic and senior fellow at the Agora Institute at John Hopkins University, where she runs a project on 21st century disinformation. Before jumping into the discussion of the delicacies of the schism and autocratization of the political right, just some words on the housekeeping rules. Approximately half of the book talk will be devoted to the questions and answers. I would like to encourage you to send your questions via Zoom's chat function to me. I will either unmute you that you can ask your question in person, or I will bunch together the questions that are closely interrelated. Ms. Applebaum, your book can be read as a powerful wake-up call. You describe very sensitively how the attitude in the never Trump pro-establishment American elite changed around 2016, 2017 from the old refrain, it can't happen here to the perception of the danger, it's happening now and must be stopped. Your case studies of Poland, Hungary, the United Kingdom and the US are convincing building blocks of the narrative that Western type liberal democracy faces the very same right authoritarian challenge both in its Anglo-Saxon heartland and in the former communist countries in Central and Eastern Europe. But what are the common elements of these four cases that for many appear to be rather unrelated and, and different ones? And why do so many still share the attitude in continental Europe, especially in Germany, that it can't happen here, although it's just happening right now, both in EU member states and the US? Um, so first of all, thank you very much um, for the introduction, and you know it's very nice um, to, to to be here with you, you know, virtually, if not if not if not in real life. Um, so yes, the book is about a range of countries. It's also there's there's a there's a chapter on Spain as well, and there's some references to other countries, um, Greece, and a few other places. Um, and the book is really an attempt to explain what is the attraction. Of um, you know of of a certain brand of authoritarianism to intellectuals who were once on the center right. Um, what, uh, it actually the book actually starts with a description of a a party that I held in 1999, and I just use the party as a kind of metaphor for the kinds of people who were all able to be in one room together and were friends, and are now um, this is the party that took place in Poland are now on very opposite sides of what is an incredibly polarized and you know bitterly divided country and so the question is what the divide came from and and why um, why some in that some in some in what was a single group chose another path um, and the book really again there's no one answer it, it doesn't have a it doesn't have a single explanation and it doesn't offer any policy prescriptions so I think for political scientists and think tankers, it might even be a little annoying um, because it just opens some questions rather than offering um, a lot of answers. But, 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 I, but I, I answer it by looking at specific people and specific stories. Um, in Poland, I write a lot about 
um, the question of what happened after 1990 and why some people who had been part of the opposition um, in the 1980s were not able to succeed, or at least not to the degree that they felt they should have succeeded um, in the new society and why this you know, made them turn against it. Um, and so there is a, um, you know, there's a description of how meritocracy, which created a whole series of competitions inside Poland and of course inside all of the um, new post-communist states, um, competition for, you know, in the business sector, which we call free markets, competition for in the civil service, you know, which, which began to be run by exams, competition in public life. Um, and some people lost these competitions or that anyway, they weren't, as I said, they weren't succeeding to the degree that they were. And so instead they've created a kind of counter system now, which is a political party that seeks to end those competitions. You know, jobs will be given about according to loyalty. You know, if you're loyal to the party, you get the job. Um, the business sector will be slowly subsumed by the, by the ruling party as well. And businessmen who owe their fortunes somehow to the state will be somehow favored and promoted. This is, of course, the system that now already exists in Hungary. Um, doesn't exist in Poland until now. We, do, we don't have oligarchs here in that sense, although I think that's what the ruling party would like to create. Um, and then also explains how for some journalists, pundits, kind of political spin doctors, you know, the rise of this authoritarian party offered them a way up personally as well. And I describe one famous case, which is the story of Jacek Kurski, who is the chairman of Polish television, um, which is a propaganda arm of the ruling party now. I mean, for example, during the recent presidential election, um, it didn't show, I don't think, as far as I know, any um, election meetings of the opposition leader. It only showed the president. Um, it ran a series of um, uh, kind of, um, you know, items that were designed to support his campaign, which was the center of his campaign was an anti-gay, um, so that he called it anti-LGBT um, campaign, and that was supported by lots of items on Polish television, state television, asking whether, you know, do you want the National Independence Day parade to be replaced by a gay pride parade, that kind of, that, those kind of television programs. Um, so that's one part of the answer. Um, another part of the answer, and this I explore more in the context of talking about Britain, is that there were a number of conservative intellectuals um, in the 90s, you know, after the Cold War, and who began to feel something that I would describe as a kind of cultural despair, um, a sense that, you know, our societies are um, going downhill, they are failing, they are degenerate, um, they are, um, you know, for, for social reasons, for intellectual reasons, we're not producing great leaders anymore, we're run by mediocrities, democracy produces mediocre leaders, and this, by the way, has been a criticism of democracy for a long time. Um, you know, we need great men, we need some kind of something different. Um, and that you can, you can find it in the writings, particularly of both um, American and, and, and British thinkers, um, you know, at that same period. You know, the Cold War had held together um, in all of our countries, actually. Um, I think these coalitions, anti-communist or anti-left coalitions, sometimes centrist coalitions, um, you know, and after the Cold War ended, those coalitions began to break apart. And those who felt that, you know, as I said, society was deeply and profoundly lacking or, you know, went in one direction. Um, those who feared for the end of Christianity were, were very prominent. Some, uh, that, was, that was the motivation for many people to be anti-communist. Um, and then those who believed, you know, in a different set of ideas and in, in, in liberalism and, and, and international integration went, went a different direction. So the book also describes the breakup of these coalitions and, and how that affected particular people's lives and, and decisions and things that they wrote, as well as the opportunities that these authoritarian, new kinds of authoritarian movements on the right gave them, you know, to, to have a larger say again. I mean, the book has been, you know, it's funny, one of the reviewers has already said, oh, you know, Anne Applebaum is not, doesn't seem to be very interested in the question of why people vote for these authoritarians. Well, no, it's not that I'm not interested in that. Of course, I'm interested. But a lot has been written about that. Um, and not that much has been written about the people who made these movements happen. I mean, who are they? Um, what is their motivation? Why are they doing it? Um, and so, you know, this was trying to give a slightly different um, um, view of them. I mean, in essence, quite a lot of these movements involve one part of the elite attacking another part of the elite. I mean, that's essentially what the Brexit campaign was. 
Um, and so you then have to ask, well, you know, you know, why is that happening? Again, competition, sense of despair, um, you know, d desire for power, um, even attraction to the idea, as I said, of, of a single voice or a single party or a single political movement that just could make everybody else shut up, you know, in this world where there's a lot of cacophony. So as I said, I explore those different answers through, through different stories in the book. Um, yes, I think your explanation uh, of, about the motivation of these elites is, is very convincing. Uh, you write in the book that new authoritarianism didn't rise, quote, because of mystical ghosts of the past, but as a result of specific actions of people who disliked their existing democracies. They disliked them because they were too weak or too imitative, too indecisive or too individualistic, or because they personally were not advancing fast enough with them, unquote. But I think it's, it's not true that you don't give an answer in the book why these people, these anti-elites and these movements ultimately were able to succeed. How and why were they able to, to succeed and partially fulfill the program of establishing an anti-meritocratic and, and authoritarian system? Uh, I mean, they, you know, they effectively sold their, their views to the public. I, I mean, I suppose I do, I do, in the first part of the book, I do talk a lot about the role of conspiracy theory um, and the effectiveness, um, you know, the, the successful use of conspiracy theory to create new political movements and even new political identities. Um, the one I talk about in greatest detail is the one that was used in Poland. Um, some of you will remember that there was a plane crash a decade ago that killed the then president of Poland, Lech Kaczynski. Uh, Kaczynski's twin brother, Jarosław Kaczynski, is now the leader of the Law and Justice Party, which um, is the ruling party in Poland. Um, you know, over several years, um, Kaczynski and his party created, you know, began to argue that the plane crash, I mean, they never actually had an, one explanation, but, you know, it was somehow the fault of the then government, which was then the government of Donald Tusk, um, the sort of center-right liberal government. Um, it was the fault of the Russians. Um, it was the, you know, they, they created multiple actual explanations of, of why the plane might have crashed, other than the one that was found by, um, by a Polish commission that looked into it, which, you know, determined that it was essentially pilot error partly because the pilot was under pressure from the president himself to land quickly, um, which was, uh, you know, and operating, again, you know, the president was sending his team into the cockpit to tell the pilot to land, which is, of course, against all kinds of rules. Um, and, they, and they created this, you know, this movement around this belief that there had been a, you know, that, you know and, and think about the power of this, the whole establishment, all the government, ruling party, the bureaucrats, the newspapers, they're all covering up the death of the president. You know, they're lying about it to you. You know, if you can get a quarter of the population to believe that, um, to believe this lie, um, then you can get them to believe that everything else is a lie. You know, so, you know, it's a way of, they sought very successfully to undermine trust in politics, trust in institutions. Trust is already low in Poland, um, even in you know, 2010, 2012, um, and, to, and, to, and to undermine the basis of, again, once you convince people that there is a conspiracy, they're hiding this terrible crime, um, then you, you know, then you open up a path for, um, to argue that the system needs to be taken down, you know, it needs to be transformed. Um, and so that's, that's one of the, one of the explanations I give in the book. I mean, you know, I do think it's fair that the, I think that the right understood before the left, although, you know, it depends on a lot of this changes from country to country, I think understood the, the nature of social media better earlier in, and the way it could be used in this negative sense, um, in that the, you know, the algorithms inside Facebook favor anger, you know, high emotions, fear, um, um, you know, terror even. Um, and they figured out how to use this system and how to pump out angry and, um, and conspiratorial messages um, in such a way as to create sort of almost alternate identities. I mean, one of the amazing things about Poland is that, you know, look, we're talking about a country that is completely homogenous. You know, it's whatever, the, depending on how you count, 99% Catholic, I don't know, 99.5% Catholic. It's monolingual. Um, and yet in Poland, we have, you have the feeling here that you live in a tribally divided state in which there's a profound division between people and they can't even speak to one another and families break up over, 
over, over political divides. And actually, there's a lot of similarity between that and the US. Um, and the leaders who have capitalized on this polarization and deepened it and used it to, to, to ride to power, um, you know, have been the most successful. I mean, you know, the, you know I don't talk that much about, um, you know, Germany, France, and a number of other European allies. There are some references to other European leaders. I mean, there are certainly other leaders attempting to use those same tactics in other countries. Um, they just haven't won elections yet. Um, but that doesn't mean they won't win. Um, they may well win in the future. I mean, I tend to think that it's, you know, people like to explain Hungary and Poland as some kind of problem with post-communist or, you know, that it's some hangover from the past. I genuinely, I mean, as, you're, as the quote you read aloud um, uh, illustrates, I genuinely don't believe that. Um, you know, we didn't have um, anti-Semitism on public television in Poland five years ago. You know, we have it now because they've brought it back. You know, we didn't have, um, you know, an obsession with victimhood and a constant portrayal of Poland as the victim of history five or 10 years ago. We have it now. You know, in other words, the party has brought back a lot of these historical issues and historical attitudes um, that were not, certainly they were not, they didn't exist in the public sphere and they weren't part of politics. Um, uh, you know, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why you can see these resemblances between Central Europe and the United States, because you see actually very similar processes happening in both in both places. And, you know, certainly in the United States, you can't talk about an authoritarian tradition or, you know, the fact that communism only ended there three decades ago. So, um, I, you know, I really think that these are tools that can be used anywhere by anybody. Um, you know, and the reason why they've succeeded in particular places, you know, you'd have to go and look at the at the particular politics. But I mean, they could ha could happen in France. I can imagine that. Um, it could happen in Italy. I can imagine that. Um, you know, look at look at Turkey. Look at the Philippines. Um, uh, you know, they're 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 look at India. Actually, I mean, you can see these kinds of authoritarian tactics um, at work um, in many ex democracies democracies or ex democracies all over the world. Yes, you make a rather surprising statement regarding the ideological roots of Trumpism. You write, quote, by 2016, some of the arguments of the old Marxist left, their hatred of ordinary bourgeois politics and their longing for revolutionary change met and mingled with the Christian's right despair about the future of American democracy. Together, they produced the restorative nostalgic campaign rhetoric of Donald Trump, unquote. And I agree that the unsubtle liberalism critic of the left that often failed to differentiate between the social impacts of certain neoliberal economic policies and liberalism as a whole contributed to the stunning su success of the recent rise of illiberalism. But old Marxism is not necessarily the first thing what comes to one's mind when thinking about the intellectual traditions of Trumpism. And the political responsibility of the, of the right, of the GOP in the United States or the Tories in the UK, for example, is unquestionable. In, in some parts, you touch upon the issue on the responsibility of the political left. Uh, what is the responsibility of the political left in the rise of the new authoritarianism? So that's, a, I mean, I'd have to kind of parse that question. I'm not quite sure what you mean by asking that. I mean, so what I wrote about in the book was the, was the way in which the populist right, actually, although I don't use the word populism in the book at all, I would note that, let's call it the authoritarian right, um, uses similar language to the old, you know, what was the far left in America in the, in the 60s and 70s. And this is the language, again, the language of, you know, democracy is weak, you know, liberalism is degenerate, um, you know, all these institutions, whether it's the media or Congress, you know, these are all, very thin and they don't matter, you know, bourgeois democracy, which was a Leninist term, um, is one you can now, you can find a version of on the far right now too. Um, and, the, and the kind of disgust for those institutions um, became part of a, you know, of an alt-right or an authoritarian right um, set of ideas um, in the United States. And also the, you know, the, the belief that, you know, if we can't win elections legally, um, then we have the right to try and win them illegally. And this is now increasingly an argument on the right in the United States. Okay, you know, we're, we're losing because of demographics, because we've made ourselves, and the Republican Party has made itself into, a, um, into an all-white party. Um, so therefore, how are we going to win again? Well, we're going to win through voter suppression. We're going to win through gerrymandering districts. Um, we're going to win by... 
um, you know, you know, seeking to deny the Americanness of our opponents, you know, by describing ourselves as the only true Americans. Um, and all of these tactics are, you know, signs of a, of a, you know, of actually a minority party. Um, uh, you know, and the, and the use of that, of that, of that kind of language, this, you know, this is how the left, far left, I should say, very far left, used to talk in the United States when it was a tiny minority, you know, okay, we can't win in a normal way, then we need to win through revolution, or we need to win through cheating, or, you know, so, um, so that's, that was the kind of comparison um, that I was making. I mean, there's another way you can talk about the far left and the far right in the United States, and that is that the, you know, the, the instinct towards authoritarianism and the instinct towards wanting to silence your opponents, um, you can certainly find on both sides of the political spectrum. I mean, there's no question. Um, and I even think that the extremism on, that you can find in parts of the American left, and this is true in other countries too, um, has been increased by the, by the fact of Trump being in the White House. Um, you know, Trump's very existence, I mean, the fact that we have a racist president, or at least someone who's willing to use racist language when necessary, or talk about the Confederate flag or so on, the fact that we have a president like that in the White House has increased the credibility of people who are opposed to the American project from a left-wing point of view. You know, so the, there's a part of the American left that said for a long time, in America, it's all a lie, and there's no such thing as progress, and we're really, it's really just a racist state, and American history is a story of oppression, and so on. There's a, there's a view like that you can find on the left, which has always been very minority and obscure. Well, they've just been given a huge amount of credibility by, by Trump in the White House and have become, I think, louder and more appealing as a result. So there's a way in which, I mean, you know, this phenomenon we know from the 1930s, where the, the far right and the far left um, kind of, you know, increase one another's, um, increase one another's popularity. Uh, yes, and just my last brief question before jumping into the Q&A is whether a democratic and non-violent turn from new authoritarianism back to liberal democracy is possible at all. You write, representing the attitudes of hardcore Trump supporters that, quote, any price should be paid, any crime should be forgiven, any outrage should be ignored, if that's what it takes to get the real America, the old America back, unquote. And obviously the same applies for England, Poland, or Hungary as well. And with an eye on the tragic cases of Pavel Adamowicz and, and Joe Cox, can we expect from the new authoritarian incumbents, their clerks and ideological supporters, a peaceful surrendering of power in case of a lost election? I, you know, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, we're going to see in the United States if Trump loses um, what happens. Um, you know, one of the oddities of the current moments, and actually the person who's written the best about this is actually David Frum, is that in the current, in current politics, in order to silence people or repress them, you don't need street gangs, you know, I don't know, troop, you know, stormtroopers, as you need, you know, in the 1930s, when politics took place on the street, when people were on the street more than they are now, you know, then the function of having kind of paramilitaries, um, you know, supporting your movement um, and using real violence mattered more. Um, in the modern world, a lot of the, when, where politics have shifted online, people's tactics are different. Um, and now they use Twitter mobs or harassment, you know, to get rid of or suppress people more than they've used real violence. But I mean, look, I, you know, there are a lot of people now wondering whether Trump will give up power um, easily if he loses in November, um, what his supporters will do, you know, can we expect incidences of riots or violence um, based on that? And, um, you know, and, and, and we'll see. I mean, the, I think the answer is we don't know. I mean, the, you know, the game of these kinds of leaders is to alter politics so that they don't lose. So whether it's changing the rules, whether it's as in Poland, you know, making state television into party propaganda, whether it's as in Hungary, you know, reducing the power of opposition mayors or local leaders who happen to win elections, um, you know, whatever the games are, um, or tilting the playing field in economics and in business, um, whatever that, you know, whatever the game is, um, you know, they seek to avoid, they seek to use those kinds of tools. And so far, you know, so far, mostly they don't use violence, although you're right, there have been political assassinations um, coming from the far right. Um, but, you know, if there's a major overturn of power, then we'll see. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's time to open the Q&A. Uh, please send me your questions via the chat function of Zoom and I will either bunch them together or call and unmute you that you can address your questions directly to, to Ms. Applebaum. And, uh, and probably we could start with a question that is related to the concept, uh, what you call big lie uh, in, uh, in your book. Uh, the question of, uh, sorry, uh, Ger uh, Gerard Loftus. Uh, which, uh, which is that do politicians playing the populist card or the authoritarian card uh, get the joke? In other words, it is just an act, what they perform, or uh, they are really convinced uh, of their ideology. And whether their followers are convinced uh, about this ideology. Uh, for example, do the Trump funds really think, for example, that a billionaire New Yorker is really the man of the people? How could this, uh, this sort of cognitive dissonance, both at the level of political actors and at the level of followers, somehow be solved? So, you know, it some depends on which politicians you're talking about. Um, there, you know, there, there are different people who have different, who've bought into these views in a different way. I mean, in my view, Trump is 100% cynical. I mean, he's, he is, um, his, his, he does have, he has some kind of instinct for division and, and some kind of instinct for, um, what will attract people who are who have an authoritarian instinct to his um, to his cause? But I don't believe he believes in anything. Actually, I mean, I think his career shows that that he's um, he's not especially patriotic. He's not never been. Um, he's not an honest businessman. I mean, he doesn't play by the rules of any game. So I, I think he's completely cynical. I think the Polish ruling party is completely cynical. I mean, for example, their use of anti-LGBT language in the last election. I mean, does it mean that they're now going to arrest gay people and beat them up and so on? No, I don't think so. I think they're now going to drop it. You know, it's just a tool to kind of get people to come out to vote. Um, do I think Viktor Orban really thinks that George Soros is, you know, it, you know, is undermining his country and is trying to destroy Hungary with immigrants? No, uh, you know, I don't believe he believes that either. I mean, I think for the most part, these are, we're talking about extremely cynical people who are using these kinds of conspiracy theories and you know, this kind of divisive tactics um, in order to win elections. I mean, are there some true believers around? Sure. I mean, there are, um, you know, there are, there, are, there are people who believe in these causes and so on. I, I tend to not think that the, the main leadership do. I mean, as for voters, I mean, again, my book is not about voters. I mean, I think, you know, writing about why millions of people vote one way or the other requires a different I don't know, a different set of investigative tools and rather than my little, this is a very small brief book and really it's kind of, you know, partly biographical, part autobiographical, partly political philosophy, really. Um, it's not, and partly, you know, reporting. It's not, a, it's not an attempt to do a big scale investigation. Um, why people vote that way is, is really a different question. And again, I think um, the answer depends on the voter and on the country. I mean, I think probably I don't know, in both in Poland and the United States, I think there are voters who share this, you know, this despair at the country. I think there are voters who share fear of modernity and fear of change and fear of cacophony, fear of the noise of modern politics. Um, you know, I think there, there are a lot of rural voters in Poland who, for whom the, even the expression LGBT, which sounds very foreign and strange in Polish and is used a lot by by the ruling party. I think they fear uh, some kind of attack on, you know, they do fear an attack on the Polish family and on their children. I don't know, it's been, it's, it's never been clear exactly what that would be, but you know, they, I think it's probably, they probably are afraid of it. Um, you know, and I think these are, I think it's true that there are real and deep anxieties in all of our societies right now um, about the kind of information we create online, about the consequences of globalization, about um, the con you know some of the consequences of market capitalism, um, about some of the consequences of demographic change, both immigration and especially in Central Europe, emigration. Um, even Krastev has written very brilliantly about the effect on countries of lots of young people leaving, um, and the, the panic, kind of demographic panic that that can create. So you know I think there are real issues, um, you know that that some authoritarian parties have understood and reached for. Um, I'm not sure that I believe that these parties have answers for their, you know, that their policies are, you know, create any solutions, but, but, you know, are there, are there deeper underlying issues that cause this fear? You know, yeah, of course there are. 
In your closing chapter, you've write that ultimately democratically committed politicians, what can do is choosing their allies and comrades wisely. And uh, we have a related question from Ms. Thomas Eskrit uh, from the Reuters and Elizabeth, I wonder whether you could unmute Mr. Eskrit to, uh, to ask his question. Uh, Mr. Eskrit, you are unmuted. Please go on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, as I said, I mean, I, I, I haven't read the book, um, although it sounds very interesting, um, and I will try to do so. But um, in your Atlantic article, you talk about uh, your disappointment at the later traje trajectory of some of those people you met in your, um, yeah, some of those people you were close to in the '90s. And the one I remember in particular was Mario Schmidt. You mentioned, um, and how, and how you were surprised, but also disappointed by their later trajectory of what they became, and how you find uh, now. Now, of course, you don't see them as allies at all. Um, and I was thinking, I mean, I was wondering if there are any lessons that can be drawn from your experiences then, that there are signs you should have paid more attention to, perhaps. But also, like, if you were talking, you know, the, the, the young people who were fighting against these, uh, these authoritarian regimes now, um, they're also looking around for allies. What would you tell them? What, what mistakes should they not make in picking their allies when it comes to? Uh, uh, is there any lesson when you look back that you could draw? I mean, so those are actually two quite different questions. I mean, um, I suppose the lesson really is that, I mean, the lesson of, of the last 20 years is never to take um, liberal democracy for granted. I mean, once you've got a democratic system, that doesn't mean you keep it. And by the way, that applies to the US and Britain, which are the world's oldest democracies, as well as all the rest. Um, you know, democracy is something that requires constant work and the involvement of people um, in, in a way that, you know, we probably didn't give enough credit to in the 1990s. Um, you know, for younger people, um, you know, the, the, the best suggestion I can say is to broaden your alliances. Um, um, you know, the, one of the, if you look at the, if you look at voting patterns in the recent Polish election, I mean, it's true that the opposition candidate who won 49% of the vote won all of the cities. I mean, not just the big cities, all of the little cities as well. I mean, and even kind of large, small towns, I would say. Um, and, you know, but, but he didn't win, um, you know, he didn't win anybody in the countryside and the countryside voted in larger numbers. And the reasons for this are specific to Poland and they're to do with um, transfers of money to those regions that have happened partly to do with that in the last decade, as well as, you know, just rhetoric. Um, but I would tell, um, you know, younger people to start looking for alliances in different parts of the country. You know, um, I was, this will sound like an odd comparison, but I was just a few months ago when it was still possible to travel, I was in Venezuela um, and when I was in Venezuela, I met a really extraordinary group of people who ran an organization that was, it actually was just about creating food kitchens in poor neighborhoods in Caracas. Um, this, was a, this was a group of people from the wealthier part of the city. Caracas is very bipolarized. It's very, there's a wealthy part and a poor part and they are physically separate. Um, and this was a group who created a, a kind of team of people to go into the poorer districts and create, to do a kind of project that involved um, feeding children, basically, which is a problem in Venezuela where there's genuine starvation. Um, and, but, but, and there was a kind of, although this was a charity, there was a political motivation behind it. And part of the political motion was to bridge this polarization, you know, to kind of cross some of these dividing lines. Um, and to go into the parts of the, the neighborhoods that had been pro Chavez and pro, who were pro the government and try and find allies there. Um, and I'm, you know, in, in Poland, there is a problem, for example, with the Eastern part of the country lacking a lot of the amenities that the West has. Um, and I'm thinking of cultural amenities. So film festivals, theaters, um, discussion groups, and so on, you know, maybe there's a role for younger people to bring some of that to the east you know maybe there should be um you know we've we've all talked a lot in the last i've been part of a lot of conversations about you know promoting polish culture abroad and around the world well maybe polish culture needs to be promoted in poland contemporary culture you know, that's just you know that's just a you know that's just a tiny example but looking across some of the divides getting out of um you know not just you know speaking to people outside of your immediate entourage and doing projects and trying to create things in, in other parts of your polarized society. That, I think that's the advice I would give. We have also a very interesting question from Mr. Markus Pindor from Deutschland Radio. Uh, Elisabeth, could you unmute Mr. Pindor? Uh, 
Uh, could you please try unmute Mr. Pindu? Um, okay, um, here I am. You have the floor. You have the floor. <laughs> Excuse me. Hi. <laughs> do, do you think the rise of populism is due to more to economic and social factors, um, like the crisis of uh, 2008 and 2009? Because it seems significant that the Tea Party, the rise of the Tea Party, came after that, for example. Or do you think it's more due to what we call cultural factors like the authoritarian character, as uh, uh, Theodore Adorno has described it, uh, and long-term mentalities that make, in the US, for example, the South and the Southwest different um, from the rest of the country. What do you think? So again, my book is not about broad generalizations about why the people are attracted to authoritarianism. Although I do talk about, I mean, actually there's this whole section of the book about this so-called authoritarian character. What is it? What are the modern interpretations of it? And I talk about a, a modern kind of behavioral psychologist called Karen Stenner, who's really investigated and is very interesting about it and what, what her views might have to say about some of this. Um, um, but, you know, I, I think you have to be, very, so everybody wants to explain this using economics, um, and you cannot, usually it's economics and demographics. Um, and although, of course, um, you have to see that economics plays a role and explains, um, you know, has some role in explaining politics, you also have to explain why right after 2008 and 2009, um, you know, we had the election of Barack Obama, who was then reelected. Um, and so then you have to explain why this so-called reaction against the financial crisis that produced authoritarian populism, why this occurred only um, in 2016. In other words, um, the relationship between economics and politics is quite complicated. Um, and the, um, you, know, I, you know, it's very hard for me to attribute some of these things directly. I mean, even the relationship between migration and politics is complicated. Um, if you look at the moment after the, you know, at the moment of the Yugoslav wars in Europe, there were enormous waves of migration, including Muslim migration, um, into Europe and even into Hungary, um, quite large numbers into Hungary and, and, and into other parts of Europe. And yet it didn't cause this, you know, counter reaction or, um, you know, tribal, you know, anger. You know, so, so you have to ask, you know, what would, you know, why didn't it, and why, and why does sometimes migration cause this reaction and doesn't? Um, and this is why um, my my argument in the book is that you need to look at how these kinds of crises are used and described, um, how the people seeking to express them and explain them to people. Um, you know, manipulate them or describe them or um, characterize them um, and how they're, how they're, how they're, how they then become weaponized as a part of politics. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, in the great argument as to whether, you know, Trumpism or so-called, you know, is, you know, is caused by economics or whether it's caused by cultural change, I'm in the, I'm in the cultural change argument um, because I also, I also think you need to explain why, we saw this, these very similar kinds of political changes and political movements suddenly take power all over the world, you know, at the same time, you know, in countries that really have nothing to do with one another economically. I mean, remember Poland in 2015, when Law and Justice first won, was still a huge economic success. I mean, everybody in the country was better off than they had been a decade ago in all social classes and inequality was narrowing you know, and it has been, you know, so you need to, you need some kind of explanation other than an economic one. Um, Poland, the Philippines, Turkey, the U.S., I mean, you could even include Russia in some, in some ways, had, were using, you know, you saw leaders using similar kinds of tactics. Um, you know, you can't explain that solely as, as, as economics. Um, that doesn't mean that economics don't matter. Of course, they do. And um, some of the leaders, once they've been in power, have, have, have used that further. But, but, as I said, if we're doing a big, you know, very broad, very general, you know, division of where people stand, yeah, I'm one of the people who thinks that you need the, the cultural explanations are prior to the economic ones, and they're fundamentally more important. Thank you very much. You made some very important points. Yes. Uh, David Mazuka asks whether uh, a generational shift can be witnessed across the transatlantic community. 
uh, where the unifying national experiences of the past made that be good or bad are no longer unifying for politicians and populations alike and probably that could serve as an explanation for the for the success of populist or authoritarian mobilization so i mean yes it's you know it's obviously true that we're at a moment of general kind of generation change a lot of people like to talk about people forgetting the Second World War, which I think actually happened a long time ago. I mean, the people who actually were alive and remember the Second World War are now very few, and they haven't been, you know, act for the most part active in politics in a very long time. I mean, you know, not even Chancellor Merkel remembers the Second World War, so it's a personally. Um, so, so that's but but I think we're also at a moment when people are when the memory of the Cold War is disappearing. Um, you know, you now have people in politics who were teenagers or younger when you know in 1989, and so the memory of the political divisions of that time and the and as you say that the mem the memory of what the West was, what unified it, you know, what it had in common, um, has very much faded away. Um, and I do think that's a part of the explanation. Um, this sense that we are part of a big community and a, it's a community of ideas and ideals um, and it's something that we're proud of, um, I think has very much faded. Um, and there are a lot of other reasons. I mean, partly Trump has had that impact on, on, in Europe. Um, you know, the, 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 the perceived failure of wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have had that impact as well. So, so there, there are a lot of reasons for it. But yes, I, I, think, I think the you know, the, the, the emergence of a generation that doesn't remember, doesn't have any strong feelings um, about that moment of unity and past or doesn't remember it um, is, is an important historical change. I mean, they're just simply, um, you know, it's, they have a different, the people who are beginning to vote now and people who are coming into, coming into political power now are, have a different set of memories from, um, from people a decade older. And our final question from uh, Mr. Peter Havlik from Vienna, Austria. Authoritarian tendencies seem to be related to economic and, just sorry, uh, uh, losers and uh, uh, to, to economic globalization losers and technology internet trends. If this is the case, they are likely to stay and will lead to deepening the split in societies. Is a return to liberal democracy normality under such circumstances possible? Well, so first of all, I am not one of the people who thinks that losers of globalization explain authoritarianism. I mean, I mean, very explicitly, the leaders of most of these authoritarian populist parties are not the losers of globalization. Um, and no, you know, the, you, you can't make that argument in the US, in Poland, um, you know, in the, certainly not in the UK where the Brexiteers were mostly well off um, and there were as many people who voted for it in this southern part of the country as in the north. So it's a very, um, um, you know, it's, that, that's always been a little bit tendentious. Um, but the broader thrust of your question, which is, you know, can we, can we go back to normal? I mean, actually the answer is no, I don't think we can and should go back to normal. Um, I'd like to see some really deep changes made both to our cap our form of capitalism and our democracies um, i'd like to see um, you know whether it's you know deeper thought given to the role of corruption in our societies the role of money laundering and offshore money which is very underestimated the impact of how that how how money flowing out of our countries um, has impoverished the state um, and has enabled some very bad actors in other parts of the world um, um, both economically and, and, and politically. Um, you know, I'd like to see, you know, you know I'd, I'd like to see, you know, Europe and, and the United States think once again about what they have in common as democracies, what they have in common as their values and how they can promote those values in the world um, in a sensible way. I mean, there's quite a lot of quite transformative change I'd like to see. I mean, in the United States, you know, it's clear now we need a healthcare system that you know, encompasses everybody um, that's well endowed, that people feel, you know, you know, that give people some sense of security. Um, this lack of security, this lack of feeling taken care of or part of society is clearly, you know, that I would say that rather than losers of globalization is part of the, um, it, you know, is part of, is part of what's wrong. Um, so no, I, 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 I think that, you know, I, I don't think that, well, let me put it differently. I don't think anything is inevitable. So I don't think liberal democracy is inevitable. I don't think dictatorship is inevitable. I don't think democracy has to fail, but I also don't think it has to succeed. 
Um, I think whether it fails or succeed has to do with what people in power decide to do. And, you know, do we have still the energy to carry out the big reforms we need to make now? You know, does the European Union have the energy to make itself into a geopolitical voice now? Um, as the world begins to split between the US and China, what will Europe do? Is it going to remain passive like it's been up until now? Or will it begin to have a bigger voice? You know, as Europeans um, question the, um, you know, the, their, their, their government's reaction to the coronavirus, you know, will the European Union really have the guts to help um, you know, bring European societies, you know, back to life and, and give people a sense of security. So in other words, you know, there are real decisions to be made. I mean, you know, yeah, I think democracy can be saved. I think um, an idea of, um, of unified liberal democracy can be saved. But, you know, it might, you know, there's a famous line um, from the Italian novel, The Leopard. You know, in order for everything to say the same, everything has to change. So um, if you want, you know, if you want some, you know, that, you know, those, that the, those kinds of freedoms and the division of power and the, and the right to, to, to choose your leadership to stay, you might have to change a lot of things about the way things operate now um, in order to keep those freedoms. As we're approaching the end of the webinar, I would like to say thank you for Anne Applebaum for the most interesting conversation and for you ladies and gentlemen for your questions and for being with us today. I hope that we can welcome you back in our future webinars and book talks. Have a nice day and goodbye.